Okay, so I'm uh, here in Spain um, with uh, Daniel Bergström, uh, who's produced, amongst others, Sugar, In Flames, uh, Dimmu Borgir, Behemoth, Soil Work. Um, we're going to start talking a little bit about pre-production, uh, then move on to the recording stage, and then obviously talk about mixing. What are your thoughts? We were chatting about before about click tracks. Do you have any general preferred approach, or does it largely depend on the band? To start with, it depends on the band. I mean, if they're okay with using a click track, I will prefer to use a click track. Uh, uh, it's always cool to have that reliable you know, foundation. Sure. <laughs> and um, um, even like later on in the process, when you're moving, I don't know, swap like flying channel, flying vocal takes or flying guitar takes, or it's always cool to have a click track. I can, I can understand, and I'm also doing it depending on if the band wants to sound like, oh, we want it to sound like live, we want it to sound like the rehearsal place, uh, and let's skip the click track, that's all cool, I really like that. Yeah. But then, I mean, if you're aiming for, um, you want the guitars to bleed into the drums, and yeah. you want the drums to bleed into the guitars, and, oh, I love that. <laughs> I, wish, I wish we could do that more, I, I would love to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. But nowadays it's so focused on tightness, it's yeah. so focused on on getting everything so present. Sure. So you kind of need the click track. Yeah. Sure. I, I usually tend to record record it to the rehearsal thing and I listen back to it. Yeah. Uh, and also, there is one chance where you get to see if should we use the click track or not. Yeah, sure. So and sometimes it happens that you skip the click track for certain songs. Yeah. Because you want the movement and. Yeah. It's sometimes it's hard, you know, to program the the tempo change yeah. in a good way. Yeah. So it's for a lot of things, and I I I would like to be a part of the pre-production as much as possible. And when it's like huge, like bigger sessions, I, I am, I yeah. am like the thing that we're doing right now. Sure. We've been discussing these songs for almost a year. Have to have everything in consideration. Yeah. How, how is he hitting? Yeah. The drummer. Uh, uh, I prefer the old tune snares. I really like the old tune snares, but you cannot have that when it's like a Oh, you can, but uh, yeah, it will not. Sound like a mess. Yeah, it will be a mess in the end, and it will be like, who <laughs> can really hear this new? Yeah. Uh, so um, it all depends on the songs, and I, I really like to change the snare for. I mean, the latest ones have been changed the snare for seven times. I mean, seven different snares on one album. Right. Uh, Port Noir. Yeah, yeah, Port Noir, for example, we have a lot of snares, and for the home fall, we had like eight or seven or eight different snares. Mm -hmm. You hear, you know, the riff, just by hearing the riff, I can like, ah, oh, we should use this snare. Sure. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, the question, back to the question. Um, so yeah, I prefer low two snares, and then kick, same thing, you know. Sometimes it's cool to remove the front head of the, of the kick drum, just to get more uh, low end. Yeah. Um, I really like, like a, a tacky and a, I don't know how to describe it, but a lot of attack and roundness in the tone. Uh, I really like to keep the tone a lot. Sure. Do uh, you ever, um, obviously, I know you haven't on, on this kit for the Port Noir album, but do you ever remove the resonators on the tones? No. Nah. No. Okay. No, nah, that, you know. I might have done it like one or two times, <laughs> okay. but just to uh, get like some, some freaky, bizarre sound. Sure. We've got the floor tom mic top and bottom on, on this kit here. Do you generally tend to go with the batter head and the resonator head on the toms? Yes. Right, okay. Even with a larger drum kit? Yeah, even with a larger drum kit. Right. And I, I've been doing that for a long time, but moon mic is a, kind of a new thing to me. Um, right. But I will keep on doing it, but you know, it's uh, the key. I think that's the key thing to a good tom sound. You yeah. have to mic up the both, right. okay. and you know, be careful with the face. Of course, you cannot just like oh, this face reverse it. You sure. need to find the right face. When you say finding up to the face, do you mean time alignment? Do you time have alignment? Yeah. Why? Okay. But I mean, I prefer to do that 
lie, you know. Sure. Just have somebody hit and then move and then just find a woo, there we go. It's moving the mics. Moving the mics. Moving the mics yeah. to get optimal yeah, phase. Yeah, like, you do, like you're doing when you're making up a guitar sound. And so with the snare, just usually top and bottom. Top and bottom, yeah. And, and sometimes it's even more. Uh, it's, sometimes it's cool to even mic up a rim, you know, top rim. Yeah. And even the side of the top and put it really, really, really close. And find these nasty free things it's like 2K or something and then or even lower than 2K and then distort it or whatever and then compress the shit out of it and sure. then blend that in. When you've got a kit that's got a really wide spread of symbols, mm -hmm. um, do you generally go with a space pair or more individual spot mics or symbol pairs per microphone or uh, it, yeah, it, it it all depends there too, but it depends on the volume of the symbol and, and what brand it is and what room it is. Right. Uh, but um, some, this latest one has been like three maybe. Yeah. Um, three and then sometimes I add in also the Glenn Johnson technique thing together with that. Yeah. And then people will go like, oh shit, you will have a lot of face problems, you know. But I've never had that much of a face problems in terms of symbols and, no. and snare, kick and snare. Uh, it's uh, uh, yeah. So with the three that you used on this album, how how close from the symbols were you? Uh, half meter. Right. More or oh, less. Cool. And then we were chatting about room mics earlier on. Um, obviously, we're in this marble room, so we've got a lot of reflections going on. Mm -hmm. Generally, with the room mics that you use, I mean, you keep them fairly low at about knee height. To yeah, I like that. Keep, keep the yeah. symbol washed. Get rid of the like harsh frequencies. Sure. Um, same thing, it depends on the room, but yeah. uh, I kind of like that. And then take, delete, or like minimize the, I don't know, 10 to down to yeah. know, 3, 2 something. Yeah, like compress it a lot and then add that in. Yeah. Uh, and then keep those nice things from the Glenn Johnson microphones. Yeah. And find a good combo over there. Sure. Do you Maybe, need... like sorry, but before when you close mic, I mean, if you have a drummer which has like tons of symbols and slashes and small things, so of course you spot mic them. Yeah. And I mean, I've been doing these crazy sessions when you had like thirty microphones for symbols only, and at one time I was even into like micing top and bottom symbols. So imagine that. Wow. Um, but I've never experienced that much face issues, even at that time. Interesting. Uh, and you can do really cool things with spot marking all these splashes and all these symbols. But in the end, you're, I think you're working for it. Uh, nothing. Sure, sure. <laughs> it's a good microphone, good room, good yeah. symbols, and there you go.